So we want to look, take a look at the homework problems from chapter 10. I'm going to start with problem 10.2. So it says, uh, assume you have a sample of n1 is equal to 8, so that's the sample size for the first sample, with this sample mean and given sample standard deviation. And then you have an independent sample. So this word independent here is important. What it means is these are two separate samples. And it's important because if N2 was 8, you wouldn't know whether or not these samples were paired or not. In other words, if they weren't referring to the same object under two different treatments. And that's important because it, the statistics totally changes. So these are from two independent. So this independent here doesn't mean that the sample is random per se, although it should be, and they should say that. This sample means that this sample is independent of this sample from another population. And so they're actually kind of, they're actually kind of uh, overdoing it, okay, just to make sure that you know, with again, a given sample mean, a sample standard deviation, they want to know the value for the pulled variance test statistic if you're testing at the two means or equals. So this notion of pulled variance, let's just see how to compute this, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put sample one and sample two. Okay, and um, so I'm going to go ahead um, and I'm going to put the standard deviation. So here it's going to be 4. Oops. And here it's going to be 5. And the sample sizes here are going to be 8. And we said 15. And what we want to do first is we want to compute the pooled variance. Okay, so the pooled variance is this formula. And I'm going to compute parts of it. Okay, and if we go to the, if we go to the actual, um, well, I'm just going to compute parts of it. Um, so the numerator looks like this. And there's going to be a contribution from each of the samples. So the contribution here is going to be equal to, and it's going to be this squared times the sample size minus 1. And that's going to be the contribution from the first sample. And let's see, something something's wrong there b2 squared times b... Th oh, because it's supposed to be 3, and for somehow, some reason it got changed to 31. There we go. It looks a little bit better. And now I'm gonna, just going to drag this over, and it's automatically going to compute the same thing for here. Okay? The, d the denominator is easy. The denominator is just equal to the sum of these divided by 2. So it's just this plus this minus 2. Okay. And now I'm ready to compute sp squared. This is the pooled variance. Okay, so now this is just going to be equal to the numerator that has two terms, one contribution from each sample, divided by the denominator. And of course, this should always be, there's, 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 there's a couple of ways we can check on this. First, this should be positive. But if I actually compute the pooled standard deviation, I just take the square root of the, of the variance. Notice that this value should always be between these two, and it is. So that gives me a lot of confidence that this is the correct answer. But the pooled variance is, is right here. Okay, that's the answer I want for part A. Okay, and we'll just... Uh, yeah, just that little thing here. This will be for, for part A. Okay, for part B, in finding the critical value, how many degrees of freedom do you have? Um, we didn't talk about the critical value a great deal, but basically it's just the value of the T-score which you're going to reject. Okay. Um, you could equivalently compute the p-value. That's okay. But no matter how you do it, the degrees of freedom are always the same. The, de the degrees of freedom 
for a hypothesis test where we're testing the difference between two independent populations. We're testing for the difference in the means between two independent populations. This is always n1 plus n2 minus 2. So we actually did this right here. This is 21. This was our denominator right here. Okay, um, now we want to do a, a hypothesis test. Okay, notice that the hypothesis test is one-tailed. So that's going to be important. So let's go ahead and go through the, the five steps of a hypothesis test. The first step is already done, right? We have to state the hypotheses. And they've already done that for us. So we know here that H0 is that mu1 is less than or equal to mu2. By the way, if you want to be fancy, there there actually are Greek letters um, that you can use. I'm not going to do this, but it, well, I'll just I'll just do this one time. Um, but you you can make things look really nice and format them nicely. Um, so if I do this and change that to a small m, I actually get the Greek letter mu. Okay, but I'm not going to do it because it is a lot of time, and uh, I don't want to make the video any longer than it has to be. Okay, but just, just for your own knowledge, okay? And of course the alternative is always the opposite. It's that mu1 is greater than mu2. Okay. So we're doing an upper one tail test. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to put in x bar here too now, because uh, this is going to be relevant since I'm doing a hypothesis test. And notice this is 42 and this is 34. So it makes sense. I'm testing to see if the difference is greater than zero. Okay. And so um, I'm actually going to rewrite this. This is actually going to be mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero. Why do I do this? Because notice that this is the D that always comes into the hypothesis test. Okay. So we always try to put this on the other side. Okay. So this is going to be our D. Our zero is our D. That's what the book calls D. Okay. Alright, so now we're ready for step two. We have to go ahead. We have to compute our test statistic. Of course, this is usually the hard step. But it isn't that bad because um, really we've already computed everything else. If you look at the formula, you'll see that the test statistic, it has, uh, it looks like this. It's going to be a t-score. And it's just going to be equal to x1 bar minus x2 bar minus d, which is zero here. Okay. And I want everything here in the numerator. So I'm going to put a parenthesis around the whole, all of this. And now I'm going to take the square root of, okay, and I'm, I'm going to put in my, my pulled um, uh, variance here, okay, times, and now you have to really be careful. It's 1 over n1, and kind of an easier way of doing this is to actually do it like this. Let me just do it like this, plus the variance divided by n2. It's a little easier way of doing this. Okay, so this is my test statistic. And if you look in the book for the formula in section 10.1, you'll see that it basically has this form. It's x1 bar minus x2 bar minus d. That's all in the numerator, so we have it all in parentheses, divided by the square root. And here in the book, it's sp squared times the quantity 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And I'm going to just Distribute the sp squared because it's just a little easier to type in. So this will be sp squared over n1 plus sp squared over n2. Pulled variance over n1 plus the pulled variance over n2. And now we're ready. And that's our test statistic. And we know that's a that's a pretty big test statistic even for a t square. Okay, now we're going to go ahead. We're going to compute the p value. And we have to be careful here for a couple of reasons. Okay, so first of all, we're using a t-distribution with 
21 degrees of freedom, we're also doing a one-tail test. And we also have a positive test statistic. All of these things are relevant. So what this means is I'm going to find just the percentile, and I'm not going to multiply it by 2, because I have a one-tail test. I'm going to calculate the percentile, but I'm going to calculate the upper percentile. So, let's put this all together. So, P is equal to, I'm going to do T dot, I want this here. Okay, this is my X score, my degrees of freedom are 21. I do want it to be cumulative. But I have to say 1 minus this, because this command right now will give me the probability in the left tail, which is the, which is the percentile, i.e. the lower percentile. But because this is above 0, I want the upper percentile. Okay. And as advertised, we can see that the p, the uh, p value is very, very low. Okay, now we're ready for our decision rule. Decision rule is easy with uh, the p value because um, it's always the same. Oops. So we see here that um, P, which is equal to, I'm just going to round this off, 0 0.006, is less than, and they tell us the, the alpha, 0.01, So this means we reject an all hypothesis. Okay. And they ask you, what is your statistical decision? A statistical decision is the same as a decision rule. A conclusion is what we state in every in everyday language. So if we were to go the last step, we can't say very much because we don't actually know what these quantities are, right? The most we can say is at a significance level of 0.01. So we could say at a significance level of 0.01, we conclude that the means of the two samples are not equal. Now, if I had... Um, if, if, I, if I knew what these things were, I wouldn't just put the mean to the two samples. Um, and, and I would actually say something like the means of the random variable from the two samples. Now, you know, again, if I, if I knew what this x was, this random variable x, I would actually put what it is. So if this was a like drinking water, I would say, you know, we've shown that, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, um, oh, let's see, maybe it's, uh, you know, number of milliliters in a bottle. So I would say we would conclude that, you know, um, and actually I want uh, greater, um, the mean of um, the random variable in the first sample is greater. Because I'm, I'm rejecting the null, so I'm accepting the alternative. Yeah, got to be careful. I'm doing a one-tailed test. Okay, so I'm concluding the alternative. And what is the alternative? It's that the difference is positive, which is the same as saying the mean of um, the sample 1 is greater than the mean of sample 2. Now, if I knew what this was, if I knew, for example, this was like milliliters of water, I would say we, can, we would conclude that the you know mean volume of water in the first group is greater than that of the second group, something like that. Okay, and then of course D is our statistical decision. This is always um, step step three. All right, this is a good problem to practice on and think about. And if you have any questions, just let me know.